Hello friends, welcome to another installment of my series on supplements and chemicals. Today we will be discussing what may be my favorite anabolic steroid, anadrol or oxymethylone. What I'm going to do with this video is first I'm going to summarize the outcomes of res or what I've been able to discover from research. Second, I'm going to tell you my personal opinion on anadrol, my experiences with it, how I've seen others use it and how I think it is best used. So let's get started. First of all, I want to let you guys know in the description of this video below, you'll find a link to my blog. On the blog link, you'll find a list of, um, these are my notes, which are right here in front of me, a list of, uh, basically I did a review of the literature on oxymethylone, and it's a list of interesting observations with citations. So you can easily go to this blog post and scroll through, it's not a lot of text, it's just bullet points, and you can go to the papers that I cite whenever I state something in this video, and find out more about it yourself. So let's get started. First of all, oxymethylone, which is, I'm just going to call it anadrol throughout. Uh, Anadrol was created in 1959 by a group uh, led by a gentleman named Ringgold. So I'll tell you a little bit of history about the research on the drug. So early rodent studies on Anadrol showed that Anadrol was more anabolic than any other steroid that it was compared to except Nandrolone or DECA and it was more androgenic than all the other steroids that were compared. However, Studies in skeletal muscle of rodents as well as rabbits actually showed that anadrol had appeared to have a very low affinity for the anabolic, uh, for, sorry, for the androgenic receptor, for the androgen, for AR, for the androgen receptor in skeletal muscle, which is quite a mysterious subject. And I think uh, the reason for Derek from More Plates, More Dates video on the subject with me, which was on his channel, uh, I just realized what he was referring to because I looked, I had prepared my notes before that. So, uh, it's been used, uh, Anadrol has been used by the FDA, for, uh, uh, by the FDA, by the FDA. It's currently uh, used by the FDA for the treatment of anemia. Um, there are a lot, there's a lot of research on Fanconi's and non-Fanconi's anemia in relation to Anadrol, but it's also uh, been used for HIV-induced wasting disease, for anti-thrombin-3 def deficiency, for uh, basically damaged hearts from heart failure, and for growth impairment in children. So there's a lot, actually, uh, Anadrol is one of the better researched steroids in addition to, like, the most well-researched one is Nandrolone, and then I think it's Anadrol, Winstrol, um, mostly those two, and, of course, um, uh, Oxandrolone also, Anavar. So, let's get started with the other sections. In terms of metabolism, as you guys know, every time I review one of these steroids, I have a section on my notes on metabolism. I usually don't cover it in detail in the video. Here I'm just going to mention a couple of things. I just want you guys to understand anadrol is a 17-alpha alkyl compound. What this does specifically is prevent uh, the inactivation of the molecule via oxidation at the 17-hydroxyl group, which would turn it into a 17-keto group thereby slowing this this change slows the metabolism at the liver which is specifically what's known to make oral uh, anabolic steroids so liver toxic a um, uh, couple of more things i want to mention anadrol is is metabolized into over 40 metabolites okay and its main metabolite is called mestanolone which is uh, 17 alpha methyl dhd dihydrotestosterone so this brings up we should mention it now uh, I've discussed this in other uh, steroid reviews before, but for people who, who, you know, I just want people to understand there's a couple of elements we need to think about when we try to understand what a steroid is doing in the body. First of all, the steroid is metabolized by the body into various metabolites, each of which has a biological activity. So each of those 40 metabolites may have a different effect on the androgen receptor, on the estrogen receptor, on the progesterone receptor, on the mineral corticoid receptor, on the uh, glucocorticoid receptor, each metabolite may act differently. How does anadrol affect us in the end? It affects us by how anadrol affects us and by how all its other metabolites affect us, depending on how much of that metabolite is in the body at one time. So as you can imagine, it's actually very difficult to academically understand how one of these molecules uh, affects the body in detail, like in terms of each receptor's function. So I just want that to be clear. But I still like to review this academic research in case I learn something new, which each time we learn something new. So I've also found evidence, as you'll see, that oxymethylone increases nitrogen retention, for example, more than methyl testosterone. 
uh, it increases hematopoiesis. Hematopoiesis is the creation of red blood cells. It's different than erythropoiesis because erythropoiesis is the, crea the creation of the, of the protein erythropoietin, which also creates hematopoiesis. So you can have hematopoiesis, the creation of new red blood cells, by erythropoietin or by non-erythropoietin dependent effects. So in the case of, uh, of anadrol, it seems that anadrol does not increase erythropoietin activity, but does increase hematopoiesis independently. And when combined with erythropoietin, it has a synergistic effect on the creation of new red blood cells. Also, a little bit interesting, it's been shown that some androgens can increase telomerase activity in hematopoietic cells, although it does not seem to be that anadrol does this itself. In terms of lipids, there is evidence in, uh, I think this is humans, that uh, you know, anadrol can produce hypertriglyceridemia and hyperlipidemia within six weeks. Hyperlipidemia means your LDL cholesterol is really high and maybe other cholesterols are also very high and your triglycerides, which is hypertriglyceridemia, is also very high. So basically it worsens lipid parameters in people. There are case reports of that. In terms of organ damage, this is very interesting, huh? You guys may, long-term followers of the channel may know that I'm the first person in the fitness community to ever bring out the research that shows that bodybuilders have, uh, some bodybuilders in post-mortem analyses, experience testicular fibrosis, which means that they have scar tissue in their testicles. The reason why I brought this up to people is not because it's that scary, but because it's so weird. I don't really know why there's scar tissue in the testicles. Usually, scar tissue occurs in places where damage is occurring, like oxidative stress and stuff like that. So you could have scar tissue in your liver, you could be cirrhotic, or you could have scar tissue in your kidneys, you could have glomerulosclerosis. But scar tissue in the testicles was a little bit odd to me because I didn't think that, the andro that these steroids are causing damage to the testicles. Well, oxymethylone was shown to cause free radical induced testicular damage that can be attenuated with the use of antioxidant, uh, like free radical scavengers. So very interesting. So we are confirmed that anadrol can cause this thing that we've observed in postmortem uh, humans. All of this obviously was in a rodent. Uh, it's been shown to cause cholestatic jaundice. Cholestasis is a kind of liver condition in which bile ducts are uh, basically uh, uh, filled, where bile can't, can't travel through very well. It's called, and jaundice is obviously when people turn yellow due to liver conditions. So anadrol has been shown to cause cholestatic jaundice as well as hepatitis. Um, and some fatalities through causing this in humans. After discontinuation, oxymethylone has been, or anadrol has been shown to cause pileosis hepatis, and oxymethylone has been shown to induce both benign and malignant liver tumors, which we talk about on this channel a lot. They're called adenomas or hepatocellular carcinoma, the tumors or the actual liver cancer. Um, it's also been shown to cause acute renal failure due to rhabdomyolysis. I don't know how to pronounce that word, but you guys know what rhabdo is. Rhabdo, by the way, can cause kidney failure. It's not, it's just, if you get rhabdo, you can have kidney failure. So this isn't as important. And it's also been shown to cause kidney damage, particularly to the glomerul glomeruli. That's, remember, what Fuad Abiel has scar tissue on. The glomeruli in one day old rodents. So even in newborns, it can cause this kind of scar tissue in the, in the kidneys. Some other effects before we finish our academic review, and I do apologize for the long-windedness, but I do try to be exhaustive when I do this. Um, there are case reports of anadrol inducing venous thrombosis, which is actually, by the way, one of the main dangers of having high estrogen levels. One of the main dangers of estrogen levels is venous thrombosis, including cerebral venous thrombosis, which anadrol, for some reason, has been shown to do. Um, Anadrol has also been shown to produce insulin resistance. I think this was an rodent model. Uh, anadrol, interestingly, is not able to sustain sexual drive in castrated rodents, showing you the, uh, f you know, some evidence for the reason why we need things like testosterone to have uh, full sex drive. Although I wonder if that's necessarily the exact reason, but definitely it's not enough to replace our, re sorry, Oxymethylone is not enough to replace our natural hormonal environment in driving sexual drive, at least in rodents. Finally, this is really interesting. Oxymethylone appears to suppress corticosteroid uh, production, which it seems may cause adrenal hyperplasia. So most steroids, most anabolic steroids suppress corticosteroid production, like they suppress cortisol. People who take anabolic steroids tend to have lower cortisol levels. What this paper was basically implying is that the adrenals, the adrenal glands may actually grow to make up for this. 
And also it may be possible that anadrol is not affecting mineral corticoid receptors as much, but this is a side note. Finally, although carcinogenic, oxymethone has not been shown to be genotoxic or mutagenic. So, that's the summary of the research. Now, what's my personal experience, and maybe, maybe I assume this is going to be the one I talk about the most of the steroids that I've uh, you know, been fond of personally or had experiences with. So bear with me. Um, but I've written some notes so don't go all over the place. The first thing is, so about anadrol. There are some anabolic steroids that when you take the steroid, you immediately get stronger in the gym, okay? Some of these steroids include like, for example, Anavar does this. And Anavar is quite benign and innocuous compared to some of the others. Winstrol does this too, but unfortunately it makes many people prone to injury, including myself. So it was never very useful for that purpose. Trenbolone does this too, but unfortunately it stays in your system at high doses all day, even in the acetate version, and ends up causing basically nervous system fatigue if you use it in the long term. So powerlifters and strength athletes very rarely use trembolone and, and, and there's another reason also which is that it destroys card, uh, like, um, cardiovascular uh, efficiency. So people become very tired. So there's trembolone. There's halotestin. Halotestin is very effective. Um, it, ca it causes less of an, uh, well, maybe I should compare it a little bit to halotestin, but halotestin is very effective, will immediately make you stronger and anadrol will do that too. The first time I ever took a 50 milligram pharmaceutical anadrol tab, I was probably 22 years old. It was the first time I had ever taken steroids. I had just been working out for, I've been back to the gym for a few months. You know, I used to work out before when I was a teenager and I was very strong as a teenager. So I'd been to the gym for a few months. And actually at the time I built a gym in my apartment. So my living room was actually a full gym. Would have been great by the way for coronavirus. Unfortunately, it's in another country now. Would have been great for that. I mean, <laughs> unfortunately I don't have a gym here. But so I had a gym in my living room. And I remember, and I used to have an Alienware laptop. Some of you guys who are computer nerds or into gaming, you may know that these Alienware laptops are very heavy. I had like a, I think it's called an M17, which is the larger larger Alienware laptop. And I remember I took the, the Anadrol 50 pharmaceutical uh, pill, which was made in Pakistan or something like that, but it was very high quality. So I took the pill and I was about to go to the living room to work out. And I was, uh, watching, I was watching something on my laptop and I got up about 20, 30 minutes later to lift the laptop to go into my living room. And this laptop, because it's very long and heavy, Usually I have to grab both sides, otherwise it strains my, my wrist a little bit. I recall getting off the, the desk, having just taken the Anadrol 30 minutes before. No, I didn't expect anything. Lifting the laptop, and as I come to put my hand on the other side, I realize I don't need my hand on the other side. <laughs> it's very light. The laptop was suddenly really light. So I went into the living room, worked out all my weights, I mean, 10 to 20% increases all of a sudden on, on all the weights. I mean, even like a bicep curl or something like that. And uh, so I fell in love with Anadrol. Of course, the problem with Anadrol, I, okay, now I'm going all over the place. Let me mention another thing. So the first thing is Anadrol acutely improves neural signaling. Specifically, it seems to turn on the sympathetic nervous drive. Remember, your nervous system has two nervous system, nervous system types. One is called the parasympathetic nervous system, and one is the sympathetic nervous system. It turns you on to the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight nervous system just like Trend does and Halotestin does, it does that. And, it, and because it's, I think it's because it's on that system, as well as other effects, for example, on adrenaline and so on, that are downstream to the androgen receptor and to other receptors, it causes an, an immediate improvement in neuronal signaling. So your new, it seems like your central nervous system will fire more efficiently and more effectively. So that's what causes immediate strength. So that's number one about Anadrol. Number two is it causes a dramatic increase in retention of all kinds of things. I don't know what they are exactly, neither do the scientists. Probably nitrogen and minerals and water. But basically it fills you up a lot. This filling up part is not just visual, it's not just aesthetic. As anybody who's watching this video who's ever been very strong will know, that filling up part somehow makes you stronger. People know this. Uh, you know, there's a difference between neuronal signaling and the uh, the the you know it's it's a it, it's an issue of physics really you know if your if your muscles are f more full and more tightly compact together they will be stronger so that's i think uh, the best way i can describe it so taking anadrol acutely and I'm, by the way both of these effects that i'm talking about are acute so if you take anadrol 
I mean, the second effect, the nitrogen and the retention, all that, it's less, less obvious acutely, but they're both acute. You will retain more for the next six hours or seven hours if you take an anadrol pill, and you'll also be stronger. So the, those are the two reasons that the, the, the compound was attractive to me. And well, let me tell you a little bit of background about it. It is the favorite compound among strength athletes around the world. Period. I mean, there are people that like halotestin more, maybe, or that use halotestin in addition to it, certainly. But halotestin misses an element of what anadrol does, which is this nitrogen retention, mineral retention, water retention, blood pressure shoots up, of course, because everything's tighter, more compact, and more full. Halotestin doesn't do that. So anadrol is very unique in that sense. I think I could uh, comfortably say it is the favorite drug of strength athletes around the world. And strength athletes have been known to abuse the drug. I mean, uh, people have been known to take, uh, you know. So I've never done this. I probably the most I've ever taken is 100 milligrams in a day. I, no, no, no. I think uh, I had some bad anadrol once and I took 200 milligrams a day, but it wasn't pharmaceutical. I've never taken more than 100 milligrams of a pharmaceutical anadrol a day. But there are people who take, when, when, when we talk about anadrols, an anadrol is usually 50 milligrams. So there are people who take four a day, so they take 200 milligrams. I know someone who has told me this personally, who is a world record holder and one of the legends in the whole strength world in history, who used to take sometimes 20 Anadrol 50 pills in a day. Genuinely. He's not making this up. I don't know how he ate. I asked. He still ate. And he used to eat four or five pounds of meat every day as well. So that's a little bit of background about it in the strength world. Why do bodybuilders like it? Bodybuilders like it because it can make you hold fullness in a way that not I don't think I'm not a bodybuilder I was never competing on the stages I don't know much about that but I know the chemicals very well and I know what it did to me I don't think there's any other chemical or a steroid that can do quite what anadrol does in terms of maintaining fullness I mean growth hormone does also kind of a fullness effect as well and there are some but there's nothing quite like anadrol so bodybuilders like it for that reason other bodybuilders also like it because it makes them immediately stronger when something makes you stronger in the gym, if you can lift the weight at that strength, it's a weight you couldn't lift before, you're going to get bigger than you were before. There's just no way muscles don't just get stronger. You do get improved neural signaling, but that gets limited at a certain point, and then you just have to get bigger to get stronger. So if you are stronger in the gym, then you'll be bigger. Dianabol will not make you as, stronger, as strong as Anadrol will. Nothing, I mean, maybe Halotestin or Trembolone are the only things that may do it in the short term. So what are the dangers with anadrol? Well, the first thing that most people are concerned about is liver damage. Anadrol is very androgenic. Now, I, I don't. We can talk about this uh, with this weird study about skeletal muscle androgen binding in rodents and rabbits later, but the molecule is androgenic. Trust me on this one. It's androgenic. And what causes liver cancer and liver tumors? As you guys who've been following my channel really know, it consistently we know that it is the androgenic potential combined with the time, the residence time in the liver. The longer something is in your liver and the more androgenic it is, the more likely to of developing tumors and liver cancer. So something like Trembolone that's always in your body, very androgenic, or something like Anadrol or really specifically Halotestin, the worst. Those are the things that are the most likely to cause liver damage. So that's number one. I'm sure there have been many, many, many people who have destroyed their livers using Anadrol every day. I'm certainly, certain that, I'm certain that's happened. The second thing to be concerned about is some people who are prone to gynecomastia will develop gynecomastia from Anadrol in an almost different way to the way you develop it from Dianabol or from something else. It's very weird. It, uh, it's more likely to make you lactate as well. Lactation tends to happen when uh, progesterone and estrogen are high and they suddenly shoot down. But because when women are pregnant, their progesterone and estrogen are high, then they shoot down, they start lactating. So that's a signal. Sometimes that happens to men. For some reason, that seems to happen sometimes with anadrol. Could be that anadrol has some uh, affinity for the progesterone receptor or does something progestogenic in some kind of way. But the point is, it does have a likelihood to cause gynecomastia. So if you're someone that is more prone to gynecomastia, uh, maybe uh, either you go get a surgery and my recommendation, of course, is Dr. Cruz, who's in Orange County, who's, uh, I think, the best in the U.S. for sure. And we've had people who follow the channel go to him. And that's the best scenario. If you want to be a weightlifter, you want to be strong, you want to go, you know, do this real, get rid of the glands so you can do what you need to do. If you can't get rid of them, then use something right like raloxifen or tamoxifen short term with the anadrol to block the activity at the gland. Because it, it is very likely to cause gynecomastia for some people. So those are the major uh, drawbacks. 
Before I get to how I used Anadrol and how I think it should be used for optimal results, let me talk a bit about this androgen receptor. So the question is, if Anadrol doesn't bind to the androgen receptor in skeletal muscle, what is it doing? Is it exerting its effects through other receptors? Potentially. It's very likely, as you guys have seen when, when we review these receptors, we find that random molecules activate random receptors. Like last week, not many people saw the video, but we discussed quercetin, which is from onions. We found out that quercetin actually binds to the vitamin D receptor. Who would have expected that? So you can only imagine what anadrol is doing. But more important than that, as we discussed in the beginning of this, this uh, video, there are 40 metabolites. Each of them may be effective at the androgen receptor and skeletal muscle. All that really matters at the end of the day, I mean, for us, people who have actually used it, is we know anadrol is androgenic. Your beard will get thicker if you use it long enough. It'll make you aggressive. It really will. It will acutely make... It's very androgenic, even in the nervous, in the brain. So, you know, I don't know what's going on there, but it's just a, a limitation of the research. Not so much the fact that this molecule is somehow not androgenic. Its effect in the body is very androgenic. So finally, how would I use anadrol? Or how did I use it? I've used anadrol, anadrol all kinds of ways what I found to be the most effective. And you know, if you want to try this yourself, I highly recommend it. So what, what would you do? If you want to try this yourself, of course, imagining you have a healthy liver, and this is sort of a imaginatory exercise, you take anadrol for 14 days straight. Notice what will happen to you. You'll blow up. If you're muscular, your shoulders will get very round. Your muscles will get firm and hard, even though you're a bit, a bit bloated. You'll get stronger every day. And sometime between the 8th, and 20th day, you'll regress. The, the fullness that you have in your muscle will go a little bit backwards. All that stuff will regress. I don't know exactly the reason that this happens. Is it some downregulation of the uh, complexes involved in growth signaling like IGF-1 or mTOR or something like that? Or is it an insulin sensitivity issue? Does it make people insulin resistant? Because it could also be that, I don't know. But it definitely does that. So the only time I would ever use Anadrol days in a row is if I was right before a powerlifting meet. So a couple of a few days before it may actually accrue uh, neural signaling or it's not the neural element, it's probably more the mineral and nitrogen retention. Or if I was a bodybuilder going into a competition, you might keep it a few days. I would not trust it in for more than seven days. After seven days, the effect wanes a little bit. But what if you're on your off season, you're not competing and you want to use this drug to improve your uh, athletic capacity in the long term? The biggest benefit I saw in using Anadrol was using it extremely sparingly and at low doses. Specifically, I was using it at a maximum of two to three days a week. So you choose the workouts that you really want to uh, have the highest weights on that week. If you're a power lifter, your max effort days and if you're limiting it, it might be your max effort squat or your max effort bench. You could limit it as much as you want. The more you limit it, the longer you can use it. So if you use Anadrol once a week on one workout day, you could probably get away with using it all year. With it. It depends on the person. Obviously, this is not medical advice and it's a very dangerous drug. But if you use it every day, you're not going to be able to get away with it for more than a month. You're going to really harm your liver. So the way I see it is it used to be like a pre-workout. I never took, uh, I mean, I... Uh, I've tried them, but I didn't like pre-workouts when I was at my, uh, my max, uh, maximal training capacity. I liked Anadrol, sometimes combined with testosterone suspension. But that makes it, you know, 50 milligrams of Anadrol with testosterone suspension is now much, a much bigger deal. But the point is, Anadrol is very effective two to three times a week as a pre-workout, taken 50 minutes, I mean, sorry, a half an hour to an hour before the workout. And keep in mind, that the damage it's doing at your liver as well as at your kidneys and other places is acute. And a lot of it has to do with reactive oxygen species. If you can take some of the molecules, like for example, from my liver, uh, from my liver protection protocol video, which I have a video on supplements that can protect your liver, and many of those protect your kidneys as well. If you take those supplements while taking the Anadrol two or three times a week, you can acutely inhibit some of the damage you're doing. Because as these free radicals come about in the liver, you don't just rely on glutathione, which you already have in your body, but for example, you may have enhanced glutathione synthesis because you took glycine and NAC, or you could have other compounds that protect the liver in some way, uh, instead of glutathione, for example. If they're in your body at that time, you, you avoid some of that acute liver damage. That's the optimal way. So whenever you take this, you should have your supplement regimen on track 
so that whatever day you take it as a hit to your liver, you're trying to block some of this hit to the liver and trying to maximize the value you get from the anadrol with the least uh, costs. So I've heard of also, by the way, I should mention something. I was using the anadrol two to three times a week, at least since 2016, uh, much, much before I ever met a coach named Amin Alai. Amin Alai is someone I used to work with, a nice guy. He has his program uh, for using orals, which is actually similar to the one I was using before, except what he does is he uses Anadrol one day and the next day a different oral steroid, like, uh, like uh, Anavar specifically. Now, Anavar is far less liver toxic because it's far less androgenic. But personally, I don't, see, I don't see that program as being optimal. So his idea is this. If I keep Anadrol in every day, the liver is going to get a level of toxicity that's going to cause tumors or you know, all kinds of things. So I'm going to add in this not very androgenic, but, uh, not very androgenic steroid, but it improves neural signaling acutely, like, to a lesser degree, like Anadrol. Well, in my opinion, there's no need to have perfect neural signaling all week long. You do not need to go into every workout amped up with your sympathetic nervous drive on and all that. In fact, the more you do that, the worse you're going to recover. recover. And by the way, if you do do that and want to recover better, taking a beta blocker right after your workout will make you recover better. Because it, that sympathetic nervous drive inhibits recovery. So you don't want that every day, and you don't need to take more risks with your liver by adding another oral, even though it's much less dangerous, I agree. Instead, just keep the, opt the thing that is most powerful. So the anadrol is most effective two, two or three times a week. Other days, you don't need a pre-workout. Or maybe a different time of year, maybe you take, uh, you take Anavar, which I may cover in this series also. In that case, you can probably take it many days in a row. But there's no need to mix the two, in my opinion. I personally would never do that and would never recommend it to clients. I think it's just unnecessary and a little bit defeating the purpose of giving the liver a complete break. I mean, as much of a complete break as you can. So that's my view on, an on Anadrol, guys. I am obviously, I care about health and all of that, but I can admit when a chemical is really worth it, even if it is a little bit harmful. And Anadrol is definitely one of those chemicals, especially for strength athletes, but even non-strength athletes. Thank you guys so much for listening. I know I was a bit long-winded. I hope you forgive me. I'll see you guys next time.